Well, I don't know about you, are you still shocked when you see on the news of another powerful person accused of something horrific? It's hard, isn't it? They are happening so often, and these things are so horrific that we should feel, you know, undone by them. And yet, when we see them every single week, it's like we come to expect those associated with power and privilege and ultimately in positions that make them very proud, you know, self-centered kind of proud. It seems that they misuse that power. I don't talk about this very often, but I've been in a position of experiencing a boss who was a real bully. It's not Tim, don't worry. (laughs) (laughs) And feeling utterly silenced by the power he possessed, the position that he held, and the privilege that he had in that to influence and to also hide everything that was going on. And it wasn't until a couple of years later that I felt like I could speak about it, when I knew that I was free from his control. And so I'm not surprised when these accusations come up, like with the Harrods founder, it comes up years later, because there's so much fear and processing that needs to happen before you can even speak about it. Now, this morning, I'm going to talk about the persuasive power of pride. Lots of Ps. Persuasive power of pride. And how it leads people down that self-centered, conceited route. Now, just to quickly say, pride shouldn't be confused with the feeling of being proud. Okay, Pride is an enduring character trait. But feeling proud is a transitory emotion. One can feel proud without being proud. Yes, you're allowed to feel pride in something you do. Please don't hear me wrong this morning. We are proud of the things that we achieve. We're proud of perhaps our children, our families, and all their success, all that sort of stuff. That's good emotion. But when it turns to full-on pride, and that becomes your very nature, then that's different. Pride and inhabiting it, as C.S. Lewis describes it, is a complete anti-God state of mind. Anti-God state of mind. And this anti-godness, I made that word up, anti-godness is something we see all over the scriptures. Genesis 11 says this, come let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. And they used bricks instead of stone and tar for mortar. And they said, come let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we can make a name for ourselves. Otherwise we'll be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Hour of Babel an anti-God state of mind. 2 Chronicles 26 says of King Uzziah, when he was strong, he grew proud, and that was to his destruction. Similarly, we're told of King Hezekiah in chapter 32 of 2 Chronicles, but Hezekiah did not make return according to the benefit done to him, but his heart was proud. Ezekiel 28 says of the king of Tyre, Because your heart is proud and you have said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of the gods, in the heart of the seas, yet you are but a man and no God, though you make your heart like the heart of a God. King of Tyre had a proud heart and he called himself a God. If that's not the epitome of an anti-God state of mind, I don't know what is. And now in Daniel last week, we hear of King Nebuchadnezzar, Seeming to acknowledge God, the king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and the revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery, being his dream. But in chapter 3, we see that his own glory is still the king of his heart. The statue we've heard about, made of gold, is a statement of his arrogance and his misguided belief that he is the highest of highs, undefeatable, perhaps even immortal. 
though not invisible, as our song said. He is still being persuaded by the power that pride gives. Pride is a powerful and persuasive thing, and it's clearly present in the Bible. It's also seen in our culture today, as I've mentioned, perhaps in a world leader. But it can also manifest in local ways too. But for today, let's stay with the book of Daniel, where pride is compelling King Nebuchadnezzar to enforce ritual and worship, focused primarily on his own glory and power. But this worship is done under threat. Verse 6 says, whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into the blazing furnace. What power to wield when you're in that ivory tower of pride. So living under the pride of this ruler, it would be easy for Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego to be persuaded by its power also. And yet their response to Nebuchadnezzar's pride wasn't to try and match his power. It wasn't to persuade or even to try and convert him. They actually say, we don't need to defend ourselves to you. Indeed, They speak of their God and his power and ability to save, but also of their trust in him, even if he does not act in the way they hope or wish. The men knew what greater gain looked like. If God spared them from the furnace, then he would deliver them from death. And if God did not spare them from the fire, he would deliver them through death. So, Combating pride. How might we do it? What does it look like? Well, firstly, we need to have a firm foundation of faith. I feel like I'm saying this pretty much every week in these sermons, and I'm not going to apologise because I think it's probably the most essential thing. I spoke last Sunday in Wollston, but it wasn't recorded, so I can say it again. (laughs) I was reading a book recently by a lady called Miranda Harris, who founded Arosha, who runs Eco Church, and we are an Eco Church here at St. Michael's. And she died before this book was published in a horrific car accident. And her husband, a couple of years later, who did survive the accident, recorded a video to explain how he was doing, you know, a couple of years on with the process. And there was this amazing quote that has just absolutely rattled me to the core, and I need to share it. If my faith is based on well-being, it's not wise. Did you get that? If my faith is based on my own well-being, it's not wise. I mean, I fall into that trap all the time. (laughs) I remember specifically... When my wife was in labor with our first son, she had a 54-hour labor. And I'm hearing winces all around the room. Um, I remember at about hour 12, calling out to God quite calmly. Okay, this is normal. Lord, please, would you just intervene? Would you help this baby come safely? 24 hours, my prayers got a bit more desperate. Where are you, Lord? (laughs) And then... Near the end, it's like, Lord, what are you doing? How dare you? A week, my faith was, of course, I love my wife, and that's where it came from, but if faith is based only on our well-being, and it's not wise, and that's something that Meshach, I've forgotten their names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew quite well. The Jews knew what it was to live within a society where they were often oppressed, and yet their faith would keep them, keep them grounded, keep them going, persevering. What a truth to grasp this morning. And it's not natural. How many times have we all wavered in faith because we've been hit by illness or grief or even disaster, and yet wisdom suggests that faith stands apart from that. Its foundation is not our well-being, 
But as we've seen in Daniel 3, our faith should be based on who God is. And even if he doesn't act as we hope, we trust that he is still good. He's still who he is. So what's your faith based on? It's a tough question. Where faith is based on well-being, it's not wise. The wise response is, Base it on who God declares himself to be. Secondly, combating pride doesn't necessarily take eloquent answers or even a big demonstration of defiance. It's worth noting in verse 8 that Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego weren't noticed by the king directly when they first didn't worship. They didn't make a grand public protest. They simply, in the quiet corner of a crowd, stayed faithful to God by not bowing down in worship to anything or anyone other than Yahweh. And it wasn't until some of the astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews that the king demands some answers. This was a small act of defiance. Perhaps they'd done it before. Well, we know they've done it before. Chapter 1. They only eat vegetables instead of all of the meat that the king provides. It's a small act, but it's still defiance. But this time, the small act becomes an opportunity to witness to God publicly. And yet, as we've heard, they don't stand there with eloquent presentations or PowerPoint slides or anything else that could be of use nowadays to defend yourself. They don't bring in a lawyer. They literally say, we don't need to. God is God, and we trust him. Don't need eloquent answers all the time, or even big demonstrations. Our everyday faith of obedience to God. As Eugene Peterson would say, obedience in the same direction, facing him, is sometimes enough to combat the pride people have in the world, the power, the privilege. How does it do that, though? That's the question. Why do those small acts do something? Well, because it's contrary, isn't it? Contrasting to the pride we have, humility. And in our day and age, we're able to follow not only the example of these amazing friends of Daniel, but also Jesus too. I don't know if you've spotted any Jesus connections in this passage yet. Jesus was born in a lonely place, brought up in the backwater province and spent 30 years in obscurity. And even then he gave nearly the entirety of his life and public ministry, not grasping for the big city lights, but humbling himself in the backwater. Daniel and his friends, of course from a place of nobility in their own land to obscurity for many years in exile. So we begin to see a bit of a link. Later in his life, Matthew 27 recalls that when the leading priests and elders made accusations against Jesus, what did he do? He remained silent. He did not defend himself. Interesting. And finally, he would be the person not to rescue people by sparing them from death, but instead delivering them through it with the cross and glorious resurrection. So we see here the faith of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, and the even if quality seen in Jesus' own life. You can perhaps picture him in the Garden of Gethsemane. Take this cup away from me. But if this is your will, I will obey. He chose humility as a way of life. And this means that, that, sorry, that humility means that we can all be saved. Christ's humility then can be emulated by us as we journey with him and become like him. So for us, perhaps the takeaway from Daniel 3 needs to be an awareness of the persuasive power of pride 
in our day and age, how pride can lead us into undesired situations. Sometimes we face things because of people's power and privilege. But ultimately, we're not required to always eloquently defend our position or even our God. But in the quiet places of our lives, we can learn obedience to the way of Jesus. Defiance when needed to the idolatry of the world. And even if we find ourselves in a situation of questioning, we lean not on our strength. Nor will our faith be shaken at a threat to our well-being. But we speak of the trust we have come to know through the quiet pilgrimage of life with Jesus witnessing to God as one who has power and ultimate authority and yet chooses the humble things to speak of himself in the world and the humble things to bring about salvation. Let's pray. Lord, we pray often that we would be inspired by the people who have come before us, those saints who have lived lives with you. Not necessarily perfect lives, Lord, of course not, but lives that in important moments they choose to prioritise their relationship with you instead of the world. And so we pray that Daniel 3 would inspire us. And Lord, when we are faced, whether it be from a distance by seeing the corrosive um, impact of power and the destruction it can cause, or whether we feel that closer at home, Lord, we pray that you would shore up our faith. First and foremost, that you would draw close to us and comfort us. And remind us that, Lord, you are good. We thank you, Lord, for the example of Jesus. Who in his obedience to you showed us that while things are difficult sometimes, we can be faithful. Help us, Lord to be a people who are continually faithful and obedient to the way of Jesus. And in our small acts of defiance, we would witness to you. And I pray, Lord, that we would always look to Jesus and that we would follow in his way of humility, knowing that those things that people deem foolish, especially if they are corrupted by the persuasive power of pride, Lord, actually, they are wise. And with your spirit in us, we too can humble ourselves, and live that life and see you, by your power, work miracles in our world. Amen.